looks like Maeve, but in my family it's Mav. Apparently it depends on what county in Ireland your grandmother came from, what she migrated. <laughs> um, I've been brooding since the 60s. I used to just go right out in the back of my own house, you know, walk the dog or whatever for decades, I did that. And then starting in the 90s, I started taking trips for birding. And now I've been, I think, in 17 states and three provinces and uh, one other country other than Canada and intend to keep doing it. We just got back from a week on wonderful, at another um, wildlife refuge in um, Massachusetts, Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, which is on Plum Island. And the migration spectacle was as wonderful as it always is. So today that's what we're going to be talking about, migration. <clears throat> And throughout history, we're going to talk about two different kinds of birds, by the way, that are migratory. We're going to talk about birds that pass through the state in the spring or the fall, but they don't even bother to stop here. We're just on their way north, and they're going to breed further north. And then we're going to talk about birds that go south for the winter, but come back up here to nest and raise their young every year. And they're, both kinds of migration really excite birders and people who are just looking out their backyard. So throughout history, people have tried to understand what is migration? I mean, why does it happen? Why do we have some creatures around some time of year and they just mysteriously disappear? And a lot of the, the reasoning is quite amazing. For instance, Sophocles and many other uh, philosophers believe that birds just changed into a different bird at different times of the year, which sort of makes sense because they you know, look different at different times of the year. For instance, the reason that the, the hopu, hupu rather, which is now the national bird of Israel, turned into the European kestrel. During the, <laughs> it was the hoopoe during the summer and the European kestrel during the winter. Even though the bills are very different, but nonetheless, people did say that. And this was Sophocles, who was smart. <laughs> and other naturalists argued that summer red starts, our pretty little um, warblers, turned into robins in the winter. And that was what happened to them. Aristotle, another very smart man, speculated that birds like storks or kites or doves or swallows spent the winter hibernating in caves. And this sort of made sense, because we see birds flying in and out of caves quite often, particularly at night, so that, that made, and there are birds that roost in caves. Coastal observers would watch swallows disappear in the spring, in the fall rather, and come back in the spring, and they reasoned that they were actually spending the winter underwater, under the ocean, hibernating. And there's a great etching from the 1500s that shows fishermen pulling up this huge net, and the net is full of fish and swallows. <laughs> just, uh, I tried to find a picture of that picture so I could show it, but I can't find it. And then in the Middle Ages, people came up with what seemed like a very good explanation. If a bird just disappeared, it flew to the moon and spent months there. In fact, as late as 1703, an Englishman made the argument that flying over the ocean is unthinkable. It would be taxing for any bird. They must be wintering on the moon. <laughs> it would not be taxing at all. And many people, including many Native American tribes, thought that small birds migrated on the back of larger birds. And even up till the mid-20th century, there were places in the United States where people really believed that hummingbirds were migrating on the back of Canada geese. In fact, I was told that as a teenager, as a, as a fact. <laughs> of course, that's logical. Well, the reality of bird migration is even more fantastic than all those stories. It, and it's a subject of whole semesters, whole years, whole careers of work. Um, every single year, about 50 billion birds take to the skies to migrate. And their journeys are grueling. They require dramatic changes in their diet and their physiology and their behavior. For instance, these little guys, some swifts and swallows, these are insect-eating birds that weigh less than an ounce. Some of them migrate 6,000 miles. Arctic terns are famous for their long migrations. They make round trips over 44,000 miles a year, from the Arctic to the Antarctic, back to the Arctic, back to the Antarctic, etc. <clears throat> some really big birds, known as shearwaters, also fly more than 40,000 miles a year. And one fitted with a... a um, tracking device was found to average 200 miles a day for 200 days out of the year. Yeah, not, <laughs> that is staggering for most of us. The little guy down at the bottom, the sooty shear water, makes a loop from New Zealand to Chile, California, and Alaska, and then trans-Pacific back to New Zealand every year. And these very large shorebirds called godwits they very occasionally show up in Vermont, and one was fitted with a tracking device, and this boggles my mind, flew 6,340 miles nonstop um, over the ocean. 
rested briefly and then continued in Korea, rested briefly in North Korea and then went on to its um, nesting grounds in Alaska. And other animals have amazing migrations. I mean, um, there's um, humpback whales that go 5,000 miles between their breeding grounds off Central America and their feeding grounds in Antarctica. The monarch butterfly is totally mind-boggling. It takes four or five generations or more of monarchs to travel from their winter homes in Mexico to a short summer here in Vermont. And that final generation will live nine whole months migrate back south to the same valley in Mexico that its great, great, great grandparents left in early um, spring without ever having been there itself. But let's get back to, to birds. Migration was so simple to understand when I was a kid. I knew that birds came north in big, huge groups in the spring. They followed well-defined flyways. Then they headed south in the, in the fall in big, big groups. And they also followed well-defined flyways. None of that is true. <laughs> it's totally unproven. It is true that some uh, birds, like Canada geese, geese rather, do migrate in well-organized groups. Birds like ducks and geese and cranes need very specific wetland habitat to feed in while they're migrating. So they choose places to migrate flyways. The word flyway works for those species um, where there is food for them to migrate. As a matter of fact, the concept of flyways was tremendously important at the beginning of setting up National Wildlife Refuges. National Wildlife Refuges were established along well-known flyways um, to support migrating waterfowl. But the idea of flyways in general isn't that helpful. Um, many bird species spread out of, almost across the whole continent. Um, yellow rump warblers are a good example. They just come down in the flood, and the flood is very broad. It's not in little trickles. When they're flying from their breeding areas in Canada to winter areas, and when they're flying back up, Many kinds of birds migrate alone, or in loose flocks, or in mixed flocks. Some birds migrate during the day. Some migrate almost exclusively at night. Many species travel differently in the spring than they do in the fall, and in different routes. In the fall, they have all the time in the world. All they have to do is, they've done, they've done their job for the year, they've reproduced. All they have to do is eventually get where they're not going to freeze to death, and feed up, feed up, and then later on they can come back up here. In the spring, they're under a timetable. They gotta get north, they gotta find a territory, they gotta select a mate, they gotta lay eggs, they gotta make a nest, they gotta develop their young, and if they're going all the way to the tundra, they've only got a few weeks to do that before it starts snowing again, or freezing over again. So they're really boogieing in the spring, which is why when we're out looking at migrating warblers in the spring, we might get one or two days when we see one species, and then we don't see them again until the fall, and then they're not as pretty. <laughs> so, um, and there are a few species to further complicate the picture. Not all species migrate south in the spring and, and, and uh, north, excuse me, north in the spring and south in the fall. This little species, these adorable little rufous hummingbirds, breed in Alaska, a lot of them do. And then they migrate east, southeast, some of them, to the Atlantic coast, and then turn south. So some of these show up in Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, in the fall, as late as November, because that's when they get here. Um, people who are lucky enough or fortunate enough or lazy enough or whatever to leave up their hummingbird feeders. Sometimes they're astonished to find a hummingbird there way past the time that our breeding hummingbird has left. One species has actually been recorded flying north as winter approaches. American dippers, these amazing birds that catch all their food under fast-moving streams. They get under the stream and get little invertebrates. They sometimes go from their narrow streams in the Rockies to wider streams that might not freeze as much in Alaska as it gets colder. And they spend the winter diving under icy, icy water and coming up when it's below zero and not dying, which is just extraordinary to me. And I also had this other, it was a prejudice, not a knowledge. I knew that the birds that nest where I live are our birds. <laughs> They're ours. <laughs> reluctantly driven out from beautiful Vermont by cold weather, but they're still ours. But in fact, all of our breeding birds are descended from tropical species. They've still got lots of relatives in the tropics, and they spend much more time out of Vermont than they do in Vermont. Warblers, for example, spend 10 to 12 weeks on their breeding grounds, 25 to 30 weeks in the tropics, and then the rest of the year, four to five weeks every spring and six to eight weeks every fall, is migration. So we get them for just a tiny window of their time each year. 
<clears throat> birds are prompted to migrate by something called Zugenru. It's a German word that means migratory restlessness. And it appears to be triggered by several uh, factors, <clears throat> but the changing amount of daylight is, is pretty major. But birds often choose the exact right time to take to the air and start a flight of thousands of miles because of other things, like if the wind is in their, fa their favor. Like fall hawk watchers know that if there's been a, a wind from the north, that's a really good time to look for migrating hawks because they're going to catch a ride on that wind. They're not going to fight you know, wind that's going right at their face. So what starts a bird on its migratory journal is, journey rather, is relatively logical, relatively straightforward, but what keeps them going in the right direction is there are people studying that all over the world. How do first-born, first-year shorebirds, born way up in the Arctic Circle, head south when their parents have already left and the youngsters have no experience to tell them that where they should spend the winter is in that direction? Migratory birds have this complicated and multifaceted interface with the world. Bits and pieces of the interface are being discovered all the time by scientists, but they're going to find so much more, I think, in the next several years. Scientists know that many birds use the sun's position in the sky um, to navigate, and that they can constantly adjust if they get blown off course or something happens. They can use the sun to readjust their course. They also know that many birds use mental star charts, like in the northern hemisphere, they orient themselves based on the North Star. And they know that the Earth's magnetic forces play a role in birds' navigation, that there's something in a bird's brain that allows it to quote unquote see magnetic forces. Some study in Europe, and I don't quite get how they found this out, determined that European robins, which aren't related to ours, but they're robins, see what's really under them when they're flying, mountains and houses, and etc. but they see overlaid over that a grid that is the world's magnetic forces, which is quite extraordinary. So anyway, that's enough research information. For most birders, migration is just a cause for awe. I think every birder has a story about the first time he or she felt migration in all of its hugeness. And in the spring, mig migration is a huge relief. <laughs> it's winter is over. It's, it's spring is here. Starting in late March, birds that have spent the winter south of here start returning to Vermont. And I have a handout here that is a spring migration timetable. And today when I talk about the birds, I'm going to do them in this basic order. So I'm not going to do it in the order of families or taxonomic. Could you see if I can at the end of a, end of a roll or two? But it's, it's, um, it's not a formal thing. It's one that I've made up over 40 years of birding. But it matches, I checked eBird, it matches the eBird um, list pretty well. So this would give us an idea of what months you can expect what birds to be here and in what order they're going to start coming back to our area. <clears throat> so many years. The earliest migrants show up before we can believe that spring is here, um, in early March, even late February. And some of the early arrivals show up at our backyard feeders and just give us this wonderful uh, prediction or preview of warm weather and gardens and lawns and being outdoors without eight layers, and et cetera. To many Vermonters, the rising cree of the red, male red and blackbird is the real sign of spring. Males come back in late February or early March with the females arriving in Vermont two to four weeks later. Many migrating females actually travel further than the males, by the way, because they tend to go further south in the winter, so they have more time, a larger distance to come back. And this species is one of the most abundant birds in North America. The glossy black males, this is a, probably a first year male, it's not, or maybe a second year male, it's not quite as gorgeous, but they have bright red and yellow shoulder patches or epaulets, and they puff them up or they hide them depending on how confident or how aggressive they're feeling at that moment. Female red-winged blackbirds aren't red-winged, and they're not black, so to call them a red-winged blackbird is very confusing. Um, they look like large, darkish sparrows, but it was streaky brown plumage, like so many birds. The females are quiet colored, so they can hide on a nest. The males are bright colored because they have two tasks to do. One is to attract a female, and the other is to lead away any potential predator. So the bright colors catch the attention of a predator. But this female hides really well in cattail swamps and, and other places like that. <clears throat> Male red-winged blackbirds will do everything they can to get noticed. <laughs> they will sit all day on high perches. They will belt out that conquerie song. 
once they've chosen a section of cattail swamp or marshy field, they defend that territory with energy and ferocity. They will even try to chase away something as big as a horse. <laughs> and they seem to believe they can. A male ribbing blackbird often spends more than a fourth of his daylight hours during breeding season just defending his territory. And it's a good idea because his territory is as important to females as his color and his song. In fact, perhaps more important. A male who successfully defends a good spot can mate with as many as 15 females during one breeding season. In some populations, 90% of territorial males have more than one female within their own territory. The females also have more than one mate because a quarter to a half of nestlings in each nest is sired by somebody other than the territorial mate. So the male, other males sneak in at various times when the other male is busy. And that's, that's sort of hedging their bets. It means leaving your DNA in several different nests instead of one that can be taken out by a raccoon or, or a domestic cat or something like that. Soon after the male red-winged blackbirds arrive in the spring, they're joined by two other members of the blackbird family. And this year we had a, a grapple invasion during that very big storm in March. Um, I don't even remember how many. The entire backyard was full of grapples and red-winged blackbirds. These are taller. They have longer tails than most other blackbirds. They have longer and more tapered bills and that glossy iridescent body. In flight, their long trails sort of trail and they, they fold them down, sort of make a V, and they use their, trail, their tails for rudders <laughs> and also brakes. And grackles will eat almost anything, including garbage. Nationwide, they're the number one threat to corn crops. People really, a lot of people don't like them. They're really handsome but they will not win any popularity contests. Here's what the poet Ogden Nash said about the grackle. The grackle's voice is less than mellow. His heart is black. His eye is yellow. He bullies more attractive birds with hoodlum deeds and vulgar words. And should a human interfere, attacks that human in the rear. I cannot help but deem the grackle an ornithological debacle. <laughs> There they are, they're gorgeous. <laughs> and about the same time as grackles, you get, um, I just saw a few of these walking around the lawn a minute ago, brown-headed cowbirds. These are small, stocky blackbirds. The males are black with uh, brown heads, and the females are soft, brownish gray, almost taupe color. Cowbirds used to be found only in the grasslands of middle North America. But then as humans built towns and cleared woods, and there's more open land, the, the uh, numbers of cowbirds have greatly increased and their range has, has expanded. And they have a really interesting evolutionary history. They evolved along with a large megafauna that was after the, one of the ice ages. So they would follow huge bison and huge other large creatures, birds, to eat all the insects churned up by their, their feet. But that meant they couldn't stop and nest because the, their food source kept moving. So what they do is they lay their eggs in other birds' nests, and they usually choose a bird whose young is younger, is smaller rather, than a, than a cowbird's young. Birds are hardwired to feed the largest nestling. So they very often feed the cowbird bird baby at the expense of their own babies. Some birds have evolved wonderful ways to uh, cope with that. Other birds don't even seem to notice that it's a different species, which is very odd. And without the energy demands of building a nest, brooding over the eggs, feeding young, cowbird females can put all their energy into making eggs, and they lay more than three dozen a summer. Ouch. Oh, <laughs> Very prolific little species. Because they're basically, you know, lolling around. <laughs> so when we're out driving in March, because we're starting out way back in March, we might be startled to see a really large soaring bird. Doesn't look like a hawk or a raven or an eagle. It's a turkey vulture, and we just saw those right outside here also, six of them. From March or April through October, we have a resident vulture, the turkey vulture. These are huge birds. They have wingspans of up to 70 inches. They soar with their wings held in a slight dihedral. That means a little V. They are wind masters. They can spend hours barely flapping. So they actually look weird when they flap, because we're not used to seeing them flap. These are carrion eaters. They use their sense of smell to locate rotting meat, and they are really good at finding food. I almost never see vultures near my house in Jericho Center, except the people next door used to have sheep, and the sheep used to drop lambs. And the turkey vulture would show up the day the sheep dropped their lambs because they would eat the um, afterbirths and any stillborn lamb. 
and then they, I'd never seen him again. <laughs> and they just somehow smelled it, knew it, or whatever. They're not, um, they have, look like, they're called turkey vultures because they look, their red head sort of look like turkeys, some people thought. It's actually, their head is actually featherless. And the featherless head is a really good adaptation because they spend all their time eating by putting their head in rotting stuff, which is full of maggots and germs. And so they don't get the, the little bits of, of um, things that might poison them on their, on their heads, which, on their feathers. <clears throat> Another kind of vulture occasionally shows up in Vermont, usually not until April or later. They're almost, black vultures are almost always seen with turkey vultures. They have excellent vision, but not a very good sense of smell. So they appear to rely on their slightly larger cousins to find food. The turkey vultures' featherless heads are red. These featherless heads are black. And they are recognizable in flight for two things. Their, their tails are much shorter. And if you notice, the white on a or light color on a turkey vulture's wings are on the trailing edge of the wings, the whole trailing edge. But the light on a um, black vulture's wings are at the very end. Another really big bird starts showing up in small numbers in, in late March, early April, depending on if all the water's frozen or not. By late April, they can be seen on or near many bodies of water. And this is the double crested cormorant. This is a prehistoric looking bird. They actually did evolve very long time ago. They evolved before um, oily feathers evolved. <laughs> so they, can't, they, they, they could actually drown. They could get waterlogged and drown, unlike um, um, ducks. So they have to stand there and let their feathers dry like this, like anhingas do. They're a, a southern uh, re relative. This is the most widespread cormorant in North America. But there are many other kinds of cormorants in the world, and they're all diving fish eaters. And humans, <coughs> excuse me, have used captive cormorants to catch fish for thousands of years in places as far apart as Japan or Greece or Peru. <coughs> they take the cormorant and tie something around its throat so they can't swallow, uh, swallow the fish, put them on a line, basically fish with them, have the cormorant dive, the cormorant catches the fish, they reel them in, they take the fish out and send them back out again. <coughs> There are other early migrants that sometimes arrive without notice because they're much smaller than vultures and cormorants and they don't visit the feeders like, like the grackles and the, black, or the black, other, um, other blackbirds do. <clears throat> These birds every year startle me by being here before I expect them here. <laughs> These are plovers or plovers. They're in the shorebird family, <clears throat> but they're really found on the seashore not very often. They're found much more often and um, in fact, they're the least water associated of all the shorebirds. They can be found in pastures and fields and sandbars and mud flats and lawns, golf courses, at athletic fields. They nested last year in the park, right next to the parking lot here at the refuge. Um, right now there's a pair nesting on the roof of the Heinsberg Elementary School, which is pretty cool. And they've, this is the fourth or fifth year they've nested there. Um, the Kildare's really large round head, um, large eye and short bill are characteristic of plovers. And they're famous for their distraction display. When a predator gets near the nest, this is the bottom picture there, the adult staggers away, making sad, pitiful noises and drooping one wing, advertising that it's injured, so it's really easy prey. But if you don't get away, it will actually attack like that. And I don't know what it does, but it makes it look like it has little horns. <laughs> and it'll take on somebody my size if I'm getting too close to the nest. <clears throat> Something I didn't know until very recently is that killdeer actually are very uh, good swimmers, rather than like their distant cousins, phalaropes. The adults swim really well in fast-flowing water, and even the tiny chicks can swim across little streams. Killdeer, um, oh yeah, I said before, nest here at, at the refuge every year, and we heard some just a few minutes ago before we came in. Two other birds in the shorebird family often return to Vermont as early as March, <clears throat> and one of them is this weird-looking bird has a lot of folk names, and my favorite is Timber Doodle. I just think it's such a cute name. <laughs> They're sort of like fat robin-sized birds with an extraordinarily long bill, um, and sort of fascinating and quite adorable, I think. A great place to see woodcocks here is along the Maquam Bog Trail, although Ken, you said you saw, where did Ken go? The other Ken, okay, I thought he saw it somewhere elsewhere just recently here. Um, this trail is off Route 78. There's a 5.30 walk there tomorrow morning, um, and you might luck out and see um, woodcocks. I've very often seen them in the first tenth of a mile of that trail, or even less than a tenth of a mile. <clears throat> this trail, by the way, also does feature giant attack mosquitoes, so <laughs> be aware of that. <laughs> Size of rescue helicopters, I am not exaggerating. <laughs> um, I've had some nice encounters with, with um, 
American Woodcocks. One time I was taking a walk, and all of a sudden this ball of fury erupted from the, the, the side of the trail and started pecking at my shoelaces, my shoes, but my ankles. And it was a, a little female woodcock um, with babies. There were four or five babies right near there, and she was not going to let me come near. <clears throat> they had a really interesting courtship noise. Um, courtship, not even noise, but whole um, ritual. The males will go to a place called a lek, L-E-K. And a lek is something where male animals, it's animals in other countries, but mostly birds in this country, are strut for females in one contained area. So the, the woodcocks will go to an area, very often more than one of them, and they'll make this noise that goes like, it's this really funny um, nasal peat. And then they'll shoot way up in the air. And then coming back, they make a lovely, Twittering noise. Um, hmm, I'm able to find the noise here. I just looked at it a minute ago. It's got twitters and kisses and all sorts of funny noises in it. Um, and then it comes back to almost exactly the same place it took off and it does it again. So here's this beautiful display flight. <laughs> and it's usually right at dusk. And it's how you can't, I don't think that anyone goes out to find a woodcock <clears throat> and finds one. I think it's accidental. <laughs> but some cool places where they haven't seen is in back of the Williston Town Hall, if you're ever in back of there. There's a big field there that has four or five solar panels, and last year we watched and listened to about seven male you know, woodcocks all doing that at the same time right at dusk in back of the Williston Town Hall, which was totally unexpected. Do you have them in our backyard? You are so lucky. I don't think we saw masters here before. Nice. We didn't see them, we heard them, heard them and then you yes. see them fly up. I had it once 15 years ago in my backyard and then never again. But we, and we'd seen it before and then we didn't know what it was until we went on the Woodcock Walk. Oh, like, nice. Woodcock. That's right. <laughs> that is so cool. They're, I think they're fabulous birds. They also do a really cute thing, and I wish I had a video attached to this. They do this dance. They take a step and then they go, and they'll do it very, very slowly, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. It's, it's, people say that that's to startle earthworms into moving. They may just be because they like dancing, I don't know. But, but earthworms do make up about 60% of a woodcock's diet, and their, their um, bill is actually, do I have another picture? Yeah, flexible at the end, so they can locate and extract worms. <clears throat> Take a look at this bird and notice that the stripes on its head Here's a better picture here. Yeah, go this way, most of them. The next bird I'm going to show you, did I? Whoops, I'm going backwards, sorry. Let me do that. Oh, I think I've got it. No, that, he is going straight, okay. And the next bird has stripes that go ladder, uh, back from his bill. I don't have a single good picture of a uh, snipe, by the way. This is taken from a wonderful book called Cro uh, by a man named Crossley. He's done uh, illustrations of many, all the species in North America, I think. And I should have given credit on it. I forgot to do it. But the snipe has stripes that go from his bill straight back and looks very much like the woodcock. And it's a wetland bird like the woodcock. They forage in mud for, with their long bills. And they also have um, portrait flights you can see most curved, most not seen as much, most often at dawn and dusk. Um, they hang out in wet areas, marshes, swamps, fens, bogs, along ponds or brooks. Um, they make a sound that some people call winnowing. Um, and again, I used to have those near my house, but the little stream Near my, a little pond near my house is filling in, and so I'm getting fewer and fewer birds that like water, which is unfortunate. But here's, here's a snipe's winnowing. <laughs> yeah, you are a long gardening and it's getting dark, and you hear that, it's almost sort of chilling. <laughs> If you have an older field guide, by the way, it's listed as common snipe. Their name was changed not too long ago to Wilson snipe. Because <coughs> there is a common snipe, but its DNA, its DNA is different. It lives in, in Europe. Another bird that returns to Vermont fairly early and is way bigger than snipe or woodcocks or killdeer is this, whoops, is this beauty, the osprey. 
These are wonderful birds. These are just about decimated by DDT, like eagles and moons and peregrine falcons. And their robust return is a real success story and tribute to humans that did really amazing efforts to get these birds back. And they've also been helped by the construction of thousands and thousands of man-made nesting platforms on power poles. Although some of them do nest, just make their own. Like right along 78, you can see a, 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 a very messy looking nest in a, just in a tree. <clears throat> these raptors used to be called fish hawks. A really good name because they actually live on nothing but live fish. And they're very good fish, fishermen. Studies of many, many different ones found out that their success rate ranges from 25 to 75 percent. You know, when they catch a, a, a fish between 25 and 75 percent of the time that they dive, according to, depending on the age of the bird, where they're hunting. That's way better than most human fishermen. I mean, that's really a very good <laughs> record. Um, these are most osprey are migratory, logging as much as 160,000 miles during their 15 or 20 year lifetime. But now there's actually a non-migratory population of osprey in Florida, and the other uh, migratory ones just sort of pass over them and <laughs> go back and forth, um, because they can nest and raise young during almost any month of the year, and they do. They've sort of really changed their pattern. They've evolved to be Floridians. <laughs> there's a, there was, at least last year, a big messy osprey nest at the Stephen J. Young Marsh, so if you take that walk tomorrow, you should see it. There may be two other, is there one or two nests now? Good, good, good. <laughs> and some great, well, I, I got several pictures of Osprey. I had to cut myself down. I have like 45 pictures of Osprey, but I love them. Um, <clears throat> some great blue herons actually hang out in, in Vermont as long as possible. They're seen in the Christmas bird count some years um, in relatively warm winters. But they're very rarely seen in January, February, or early March. This may be one of the best recognized birds in the state. It's the most common and the largest of North American herons. They like both salt water and fresh water. This was in um, Newburyport, Massachusetts Harbor, so that's salt water. This was in um, Dead Creek area, I think, because that's fresh water. They often breed in colonies. If you happen to be driving the sandbar causeway and you look and you see all those osprey nests on power poles, in back of them there's some really messy nests and trees. Some of those are great blue heron nests. There's also a very large great blue heron rookery here at Missisquoi, um, but you, have to, you can't see it from a car or, or you have to be in a boat to see it. <clears throat> great blue herons hunt by walking very slowly, they almost in slow motion, or by standing completely still and then they wait for the fish to come close. In addition to fish, they also eat insects and other small creatures. In fact, I did not know that mice constitute uh, quite a large part of their diet. Um, we just knew that quite recently. And here's a very common bird that I was going to say is rarely seen, but if anyone got here a little early, you saw it, right? It was right outside. Whoops. The American bittern. <laughs> outside, doing its funny noise for 45 minutes or an hour, right beside the parking lot, which is extremely bizarre. Um, this is another bird with funny um, folk names. They are sometimes called um, bog bumper, stake driver, and my favorite, thunder pumper. And the thunder pumper is named for because of this sound. Not this, look at that. Like that. So he's doing this next to the parking lot when we drove in. It is our only North American bird that makes its song by burping. This is what it's doing. It's inhaling air and then giving it out with a great deal of effort. You know, it just looks like it's so hard to do. Um, but it did it many, many times, so it must not be difficult. But one reason we don't, we don't see them often is they, they like hunting in poor light, usually. They usually hang out in areas with dense reeds or cattails. They're all usually, because that guy was breaking all the rules. Um, their plumage is just a, a model of camouflage. And then they perfected this thing of freezing. If they're startled, they will just completely get stiff They'll put their head up like this, their little eyes will look all tense and nervous, and they won't move at all, and the stripes on their front will look just like the reeds against which they're standing. And if you look at this, there is a bittern in there. <laughs> um, but he's not, I think all of us, anyone here who's boated, has boated right by bitterns and not seen them. I'm just absolutely sure of it. <clears throat> Two other wetland birds returned to the North Country in April. That's black-crowned night herons and great egrets. 
The black crown knight here, and this is not one of my photos, I've never gotten a good one. This is a St. Albans um, burger named Bob Salter. Um, the black crown night heron is the most widespread heron in the world. It breeds on five continents. Quite common in the state. Again, most Vermonters probably have never seen one because they're usually active at dusk and during the nighttime. Um, here come my pictures of black crown night herons. Nowhere near as good. This one is along the south here. Well, this one is at the mouth of the La Platte in Shelburne. Um, I could not get a good color, but you can see that the build is very different from a great blue heron. They're stockier, they're chunkier, they have a shorter neck, um, their bill is sort of slightly curved. Um, this picture is along the South Hero Marsh Trail where I've seen them over and over and over again. And I followed this guy for a good 40 minutes trying to get a picture that was not obscured by a tree. <laughs> Never managed to do so. He does have two legs, by the way. He's just resting. <laughs> So there's a controversy about these birds. Like you probably all read about attempts to, uh, successful attempts to return breeding Atlantic puffins to many islands off the coast of Maine. Well now, black crown night herons have discovered them and they fly over from the mainland in the night and they stroll among, on those islands eating black crown, I mean, uh, puffin babies and puffin chicks. So, <laughs> and you know, people don't want to kill off another species. So actually, science, scientists on some islands are going out in the evening and putting net over the whole thing, and then going out in the morning and taking the net over the whole, of the whole thing, just to try to preserve those colonies which humans, humans restarted. They were good colonies in the long, long ago before egg hunters came along. <clears throat> These birds are gorgeous. They are, aren't seen by every birder on every outing, but they're far from rare. They're almost as big as great blue herons. They've had a lot of names. Um, and in various parts of the country, they're still called common egret, or American egret, or large <coughs> egret, or great white egret. <clears throat> These hunt in the classic um, heron fashion. They stand immobile or they move in slow motion. They catch fish with deadly jabs of those bill. These are the reason why Audubon societies were started. These and, sn and snowy herons. Um, yeah, that's snowy herons. Snowy egrets, well, that's not a wrong. <clears throat> Milliners, people who made women's hats, in the late 1800s were enamored of the egret plumes and they started putting them on hats. It was very, very stylish to have egret plumes dripping off their hats. Well, they were killed by the thousands. This, this slaughter was so upsetting to so many people, that's what started the Audubon societies, just to try to make people realize that birds could be used for something other than either eating or, or um, wearing. <clears throat> and you'll see this next picture, why they were looking for the plumes. They're gorgeous at any time of year, but look at this bird in the blue plumage. Isn't that spectacular? <clears throat> I watched this bird for 20 minutes trying to interest the female in back of him. He did his that thing with his plumes, he stomped his feet, he did this with his head over and over again, and she appeared 100% uninterested, <laughs> which was very sad. <laughs> um, but finally they did mate, so I guess it was, it was successful. <clears throat> For many years, the, the green herons, which are tiny, joined the swamp crew just a little later in the spring, in, in late April or early May. And these beauties hang out in marshes, like the Stephen J. Young Marsh has them, I've seen them down there a couple of times, particularly in marshes with trees growing along the bank or in small streams with trees growing along the bank. They look all dark from a distance, but they've actually got beautiful iridescent green and that sort of maroonish chestnut color around their neck. They're lovely. <clears throat> Again, if you have an older field guide, they're called green-backed heron or even little green heron. They change their names also. These birds actually use bait to catch fish sometimes. They have been seen breaking off tiny bits of twig or catching insects and laying them on the water in front of them. And then they wait till a fish comes up to get it and then they grab them. <clears throat> and then in late April, after our rough-legged hawks, which are our winter hawks here, have left the state for northern breeding grounds, we get another hawk coming in, and that is the broad-winged hawk. This is a small, compact raptor, black and white bands on the tail, that can be seen in Vermont from April through September. Can be seen. They aren't seen often. These are woods hawks. So you're not going to see them along the interstate. You're not going to see them on a power pole, you know, when you're out walking or anything. They nest in woods. They very often hunt beneath the canopy. Every now and then, though, we do see them, like I've seen them above my own yard this, already this year, or rather heard them. Their call is a piercing whistle on one note, so it's not even high enough. 
And if you hear that very high above, you can be pretty sure that there's a, a um, broad wind around. And these birds are stars in the fall of a migration spectacle. <clears throat> it leaves birders and non-birders breathless. During migration at some locations, these birds fill the skies in huge flocks that can number in the tens of thousands, tens of thousands. No place in, in Vermont, but from um, Mount Philo, people have seen a couple of hundred in a day. And they, they, they're rivers of rocks, and they make temporary what are called kettles. They come to a thermal, which is just where there's the, the, um, some of the ground is hotter than the ground around it, and you get rising uh, hot air. And they circle up inside that thermal. And other hawks see them doing that, and they come, and then more and more. So that if you were in uh, the Yucatan or in southern Texas, you might see a thermal that has two or three or four or five hundred broadwing hawks at once. And when they get to the top, they sort of fall off. And then they just coast using the energy that they established. One man actually estimated that a broad winged hawk could get from here to the Yucatan with 5,000 flaps. Well, can you compare that to Canada geese. You know, like this the whole time. I don't know how he made that estimate, but it sounds good. <clears throat> now let's move on to some smaller spring migrants. This is a woodpecker that doesn't stick around all winter like so many others. And the reason it doesn't is because what it says, it's a sap sucker. Um, it's closely related to woodpeckers. They have this unique feeding pattern. Instead of making really large holes and then digging out grubs or ants, they make those rolls of little shallow, almost perfectly round holes. And then they insert their bills to get sap. They also eat little insects that get stuck in the sap. <clears throat> and other, you can see some good examples of the holes on the, the picture on the right. And other animals make use of those sap sucker wells. Ruby, I mean, um, ruby-throated hummingbirds come back at about the same time that sapsuckers do, and they very often feed at sapsucker wells, particularly if it's here when the flowers are late. Um, there's a perfect source of food for them. Um, bats and porcupines also visit sapsucker wells. In April, we can also expect to see the vanguard of two species that come before, north before most of their relatives, and that is tree swallows, which have stirred outdoors, and hermit thrushes. Tree swallows are the food, the first insectivorous or bug-eating birds to return to the Northeast most years. They're small, handsome birds. There's some right outside here. Um, and they love, they've really taken to man-made boxes, particularly boxes that are the size of bluebird boxes. But they also do nest in tree cavities, like in the Stephen J. Young Marsh. If you go to the little um, wooden observation section and sit, and just look at the trees, there are going to be tree swallows coming in out of holes right near your head. <clears throat> we often see foraging flocks of tree swallows um, over farm fields, also in ponds, getting insects. Migratory birds have to balance the advantages of getting back early to the breeding grounds with the disadvantages. And advantages, if they get here earlier, the, the males that get here earlier can get the best territory. The disadvantages, if they get here before the insects are out, they die. Um, and then the later ones <laughs> um, get the best territory. Um, I was at Point Pelee, which is um, like a finger sticking down into um, Lake Erie from right south of Toronto one spring, and one whole beach was closed to birders. There were over 10,000 dead and dying tree swallows on that, on that beach. Um, so you would have thought that would have made a huge difference in the, in the population. By the next summer, the numbers were normal. Because nature adjusts very, very well to natural disasters. It do doesn't adjust very well to human disasters like oil spills. But what happened is the first early goers got up there and died. The later ones that came over had all the breeding territory they wanted, all the food. They raised more babies than usual. And by the neck, and all the babies were healthy. By the next summer, the numbers of tree swallows in Ontario was considered to be normal again. So it balanced very, very quickly. But it was quite tragic to, to see it at the moment. <laughs> And this year, um, woodcocks, by the way, the early woodcocks that came back were expected to have died. Um, they just weren't earthworms, the ground was still frozen, and then we had that huge storm in March. Um, so there was, there was a loss. There were actually people catching and bringing to rehabilitators woodcocks from all over the state, more than the rehabilitators had ever seen. <coughs> the hermit thrush comes back before any other thrushes most years. I haven't seen one yet this year, but other people have. It's a relative of the robin. It's been Vermont's state bird since 1941. Um, and in some parts of the United States, this used to be called the American nightingale. 
and which is a lovely expression, because of its beautiful song. Oops, it's the wrong thing here, thrush. They're recognized, they're slightly bigger than some other thrushes, many other thrushes, and they've got a sort of chestnut tail, which doesn't show terribly well in that picture. But, um, so here's its beautiful, beautiful nightingale song. You hear that at dusk very often, too. Robert Frost has a poem called, uh, I think the title of it is Come In. And he talks about being at the edge of the woods and hearing thrush music. And he says, though it's um, dark, I forgot the next part, the most, although it's dark inside, outside it is, no, it's a light outside, inside it is dark, too dark for a bird to adjust himself for night, but yet he's singing. And he, he says, Frost said that the thrush is saying, come in, come in. It's <laughs> a lovely thought. <clears throat> Along with hermit thrushes, ruby-crowned kinglets are back in Vermont by late April. These are one of my favorite birds. <laughs> They're tiny birds, smaller than chickadees or warblers. They appear to have limitless energy. They forage almost frantically all the time. They never, it's very hard to get a look at, flicking their wings almost constantly. This habit, the fact that they never stop moving is a good thing to identify them in, in March, and, excuse me, in April. But also, they have a, a song that they sing only for a little while, three or four weeks, I think. And it's extraordinarily loud for this little tiny, tiny bird. And very pretty. that ruby crown is shown only when the bird is feeling aggressive or threatened or full of testosterone. <laughs> um, and when you see it, it's like, it's, it's better than that picture. It's neon. It's just an amazing, amazing sight. Is that the male and female thing? Yes, I think. You know what? You caught me. I don't know because I don't remember if they change plumage in the fall. I don't, well, let me look right here. I actually don't know if the male and female look different. Some birds, many birds, are sexually dimorphic. The two species, the two sexes look different to us, maybe not to them. I mean, um, well, this doesn't help me. It just shows an adult and a juvenile. So I'm thinking that one's a juvenile. And I'm thinking the adult, I don't know. Sibley himself does not tell me what a young, I mean, a female king that looks like. Um, the reason I said they look different to us, recent studies have shown, for instance, chickadees, the males and females look alike to us. But under ultraviolet light, one of the sexes, I forgot which, has a big splash of purple right here. So to the to birds, which see at the ultraviolet end of the spectrum, the birds that look identical to us may not look identical. Um, <clears throat> several sparrows are also returning to Vermont and migrating back up here in late April. Chipping sparrows look similar to tree sparrows, which are our familiar feeder birds in the winter. They both have brown stripes on the back and the wings. They both have rusty red caps. They both have pronounced eye stripes. The chipping sparrows lack that central dot, however, and I think they're the, on the chest that the tree sparrows have. And I think they're really crisp looking. They look like cut, their face has been drawn on with a sharp, a, a small, a fine sharpie. And just, we saw one today at the feeder, but it's extraordinarily lovely. These little birds feed on the ground. They take cover in shrubs. They sing from the tops of small trees. Um, they're very common. You might have had chipping sparrows nesting in your yards. They usually build their nests fairly low, but people have found chipping, usually in a shrub or a tree, but people have found chipping sparrows nesting in hanging strands of chili peppers, um, in a hanging basket filled with moss, on an old-fashioned mower inside a tree shed, a tool shed. They're, they're pretty comfortable around human residences. <clears throat> Here's another sparrow that comes back in the um, spring. It is quite, and some stay all winter, actually quite common in Vermont, sometimes confused with the even more common song sparrows, because both species have streaky breasts and the streaks often gather into that central splotch. But the distinguishing mark of the uh, savannah sparrow is that mark of yellow near the eye, which the um, song sparrow doesn't have, and it's better to see in, in this picture. And there are savannah sparrows breeding here at the, at the refuge also. This is a grassland bird which means that it is in somewhat trouble just because grassland birds are in trouble because grasslands are, are decreasing. Um, I'll talk more about that later. 
As the name suggests, swamp sparrows are found in swamps, in wetlands. Um, they have longer legs than almost any other sparrow, allowing it to walk in water to forage. They sometimes actually stick their whole heads underwater in order to capture aquatic invertebrates. And they're often first noticed when they're heard. They just have this fast, high trill. This bird has a trill also, and I love this trill. And this is a bird that I did not recognize the, the sound for years. And then once I heard it, of course. Notice that it's got pink legs and a really stubby little pink bill. Mm -hmm. This is a field sparrow. This field of sparrows is a good name for it. And they do a, a bouncy ball call that it really is almost impossible not to, to, to get once you hear it once or twice. <laughs> it bounces it. Pretty little thing. Field sparrows have, are still common, but they declined sharply in the last half century, partly because of the expansion of suburbs where they won't nest. Goodness, it's sweaty in here. Populations in the prairies, though, remain really strong because there's been measures like the Conservation Reserve Program that's really helping a lot out in the prairie part, central part of the United States. And I'm going to put two grassland birds next, even though the first comes back to Vermont in um, April and even late March, and the second one usually doesn't arrive till May, they're out here now. Um, but I, we talked about grassland birds a minute ago. Many people consider this sweet flute-like song of the meadowlark just about the prettiest bird song in, in the world. In fact, that was why it was named meadowlark by the first Europeans that saw it. They were thinking of things like the skylark in Europe that so many people wrote poems to, Shelley wrote a poem to it, and, um, because the sound was so beautiful that they figured it had to be a lark. It's actually not related to larks at all. It's a, it's a blackbird, it's a kind of blackbird. So here's the eastern meadow lark. And I heard one outside just as we got out of the car. This um, refuge is a, is a leader in managing grasslands for meadowlarks and the next bird, bobolinks. Um, couple, uh, last year I led a field trip about grassland birds here. From the parking lot, we heard two or three meadowlarks and saw 34 bobolinks. And we stuck around for an hour and a half, it wasn't, you know, but they were everywhere. Um, 121 species of birds have been reported uh, right here at the headquarters. This is a really amazing uh, resource here. Um, so the next grass, oh, aren't they beautiful? <laughs> it looks like they'd be so visible that they'd be prey to anything, but actually if a hawk or something were going above it, they're very well camouflaged from above. So they, they look like grass from above. <clears throat> you may notice that this bird's coloring is different from every other bird we've seen today. As a matter of fact, it's different from every other bird in, in North America. They're the only bird with a color pattern of black on the bottom and white on top. And there's all sorts of um, speculation about why that is. They say the dark bellies help the, man's, the male stand out against the midday sky when he's performing courtship displays. But there are other birds that do courtship displays that don't have black bellies, so, so who knows. <laughs> um, these birds definitely show sexual dimorphism. The male and females look very different. These are female birds, and they are really well camouflaged. <clears throat> Bobolinks breed through most of northern United States and southern Canada. They spend winters south of the equator. They make a round trip of 12,000 miles a year. And they face threats, to, unfortunately, in both their winter habitat and their summer habitat. They're so beautiful. I think I have a, I thought I had a slide about that. Um, the world population of bobolinks has declined 50% since 1966. Vermont scientists are world leaders in trying to find out why and trying to change that pattern. Um, both Chris Rimmer and Rosalind Renfrew and a few others at the um, Vermont Center for Eco Studies have been instrumental in, in um, working internationally to study bobolinks, figure out where they're spending their, their winters and what we can do here to increase their breeding territories. They really need a large amount of breeding land. They can't come to your little one acre, like my backyard, I'd love that. I think the minimum is 10 acres. But if you're coming tomorrow and hear Ellen Strong's talk, you'll hear much more about that. <clears throat> And then in late April to early May, we're moving along in migration, two kinds of wrens come back to the state. House wrens are well-named. They like nesting near humans, near houses. 
Um, they are cavity nesters. They take out boxes, take over boxes that people put out hoping to attract bluebirds. They also nest in old tin cans or boots or, or boxes. Um, they fill their cavities with twigs, the males do, either to make a bed for the soft-lined cup or to make a barrier between the nest and the entrance. No one's sure really why. That, it gives them protection against cold water or predators. And they very often fill several cavities with twigs and then let the female choose the one that she, she wants to make her nest in. <laughs> and I have, I have four boxes in my backyard. Last year they were all used, but I think it was only one pair. And they were all full of twigs. <clears throat> and then marsh wrens, hard to see but easy to hear. <laughs> um, they sing all day, even during the night they sing. They nest in cattail marshes. They make little domed nests, or sometimes quite large domed nests with a hole inside or entrance, and they, they lash it to the vegetation, um, which is delightful if you ever are lucky enough to see one. But <laughs> and now the migration is into May now. And in May, birds are everywhere. New species arrive every single day. I'm going to save um, some of the warblers for other classes because there's just too many to talk about. Um, but let's talk about birds that catch insects first, catch insects first on the wing um, rather than poking around in the mud. These are flycatchers, swallows, and swifts. Eastern Phoebe is the most familiar eastern flycatcher. It's also the first species probably that was ever banded. John James Audubon took pieces of silver thread and he tied them around Phoebe's legs that, that, that were in his area where he was living. And he wanted to see if they came back, and some did. I think he got two or three back the following year out of the many 20-something that he, that he banded. Um, Phoebes nest in barns. They, they're nesting under my barn right now, under the eaves of houses, on porches, and potted plants, on outdoor light fixtures. Um, they're really quite comfortable with humans around. And two characteristics make it easy to identify this bird. It announces its name. It says over and over again, Phoebe! Phoebe! And it also does this with its tail, almost constantly when it perches. <laughs> and then we have two species that are not easy to identify. In fact, um, birders call them confusing empids, that's an empidinax um, family. <clears throat> they actually were considered the same species until the 1700s, 1970s. They were called uh, trails flycatcher. And they're impossible to tell apart unless they sing. In fact, David Sibley, I was, was lucky enough to bird with David Sibley one time, and he doesn't even bother if they're not singing. He calls them walders, which is for willow and alder put together. <laughs> it's a walder. And he says, anyone that says that's one or the other when you don't, even in, your, even in hand you couldn't tell it. They have to sing, and they have quite different um, songs. Another bird in the same genus is the least flycatcher and looks very, very similar, but a little bit easier to find because it's in woods and the other ones aren't. In other words, easier to def define, rather. It's one of the most common flycatchers in North America. It makes a sharp chivik or chivik noise, which um, is, helps it identify it. And then a flycatcher that's easy to identify and gorgeous. The Cornell Ornithology Lab calls these a large and assertive flycatcher. They usually hang out high in the forest canopy, but they're still pretty easy to find because they have easily recognized calls, this really loud, emphatic whoop or weep. I heard them from the parking lot from over there just um, as we drove up. And they often will use the same tree, even the same perch, for minutes, sometimes hours. And they'll just sally forth and grab a bug and then come back and then they'll go out and get another. Large insects, they like eating as big as, as dragonflies. And they have really distinctive coloring, that beautiful yellow breast and chestnut tail, <clears throat> yellow belly rather. And there's another big flycatcher that sits on a high perch and makes quick flights out to capture flying insects, much less common, the olive-sided flycatcher. It's most often found in boreal forests here, coniferous forests out west. They often show up in recently burned forests. They're not common in Chittenden County, where I live, um, but they have been seen and heard in Hinesburg Town Forest quite often. Um, you can also fairly regularly hear them if you go to Berlin Pond and just walk the road from the parking area and they'll be on, on the side of the road, not all the time. And their, their it's song should be described as quick three beers, quick three, I'm not doing the exact rhythm, but quick three beers, anyway. <clears throat> the Eastern Wood Peony is a, is a forest um, flycatcher. Again, heard more often than we see, the sound is unmistakable, it makes a very sad plaintive pee, pee. And it's very frequently heard in, in forests. 
Again, pretty nondescript in, in coloring. Eastern kingbirds are not nondescript, and they're not shy. These will hang out, and you can see them anywhere. They're big, sturdy-looking, broad-shouldered flycatchers. Um, they have that beautiful dark above, so a slate gray, white below, and a white um, ridge on the or tip on the end of its tail. The characteristic that gave it its name, the kingbird, it's supposed to have a crown, so they call called kingbird. You almost never see it. I have never seen it. They have crowns of yellow, orange, or red. Um, but the only time you see it is if they're with a potential predator, and then they might raise that brown, bright crown patch. And they'll also stretch their beak wide open and show the bright red interior to be very threatening. <clears throat> and as I mentioned before, tree swallows are the first swallows to return to Vermont, but after that, in the spring migration, come barn swallows and usually northern rough-winged swallows. These are well-named because they actually like man-made structures like barns. They really like them. They build cup-shaped nests out of mud in eaves or rafters, and they can be recognized by that long, deeply forked tail. I saw an amazing thing one time at barn swallows. This was at the ferry launch in Chalot. There were 40 or 50 apparently dead barn swallows lying on the ground um, with their bellies you know, lying like this, lying on their side. I thought a horrible plague had happened. As I got closer, they all flew off. <laughs> and I read that they, they sunbathe in the really, really hot days. And the assumption is two things. One, when they're molting, it may itch, and it might turn to, to let their, their <laughs> the sun warm their itchy bellies. Or the sun may kill mites and parasites. Almost all birds fight with mites and parasites, and with mites and parasites. Um, so no one knows why they do this, but they do it, and it looks very, very, very strange. <laughs> Northern ruffling swallows are not seen as often as tree or barn swallows, and they might not get noticed even if they are seen. They're sort of nondescript, plain, plain brown little birds, uh, any kind of open country, usually near water. Um, they're called rough-winged from something you can't see when you're just driving by or, or seeing them as you're walking. They have small serrations on the uh, outermost wing feathers, and no one knows why, and they might make sounds during courtship flights. Um, they nest in, in vertical dirt banks, like along um, stream banks or river bluffs or gravel pits, but they nest alone, not like colonies, in colonies like these birds. Bank swallows nest in banks, as it says, and they make colonies that are quite large. There used to be a colony right at Louis Landing. I don't know if there still is. Ken, is there still a bank swallow colony at Louis Landing? Okay, it was many years ago I saw it, like 15 years ago. <clears throat> And then after barn swallows and rough wing swallows, other swallow species come at about the same time. The bank swallows um, and the cliff swallows, which are nesting right on this building. Um, so when you go out, go to the front of the building and look up, and the nests are put this way under the eaves, so you couldn't see it unless you were, uh, had a periscope or something. But you'll see the, the swallows going back and forth. They have that white front of their, their forehead, which is very distinctive. And those are miracles of engineering. Um, the, a finished nest can contain as many as 1,200 mud pellets brought one at a time in their bill. And their nests are often as much as eight inches long, six inches wide. The entrance sometimes looks like a tube, um, and the nests are lined with dried grass. These are communal nesters. They hang out in groups and they put nests together. <clears throat> purple martins, and I notice their purple martins house is put out now at, at the uh, refuge, but tree swallows appear to be using it. This is the largest swallow in our area, the latest to get back to our area most springs. A really good place to see them is go to shore acres. And if you have a lovely supper and look at the Purple Martin houses, you will always see Purple Martins there. I think it's one of the bigger colonies in the state, actually. Um, these are bug eaters that have dark, glossy, the males are dark, dark glossy blue, the females are sort of brownish. Um, traditionally, they nested in woodpecker holes. <clears throat> But uh, Native Americans used empty gourds to, to have them nest, and now a lot of the man-made boxes look like gourds. They're meant to look like gourds, the plastic boxes. And there, as you see, they're colony nesters big time. John James Audubon used the presence or absence of Martin houses to decide where he would stay for the night. He observed in 1831, almost every country tavern has a Martin box on the upper part of its signboard. I have observed the handsomer the box, the better the inn. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's true, but... <clears throat> now we get chimney swifts back. These are, have been de described as flying cigars. 
Um, they have a really diagnostic shape, almost no bill. Actually, it's very wide, but you can't see it. It doesn't stick out. Almost no tail. They spend almost their entire lives airborne. They land only to sleep and nest, and they don't perch. They can't perch on a, on a, a twig. They have to cling to vertical walls inside chimneys, which is why it's called chimney swifts, or in hollow trees or caves. This species has suffered severe declines as chimneys fall into disuse over the, over the centuries. But if you happen to be in downtown Richmond or Waterbury, just listen for the chatter of chimney swifts. It's almost any time of day you can hear the chatter over them. Both cities have old chimneys that attract um, these species, which is good. <clears throat> and May is also bringing an interesting and vocal family of birds. I heard this, this my first of these today um, on, on the refuge. <clears throat> Vireos are bigger than warblers, but smaller than most songbirds, and they are very noisy birds. The warbling vireo is well named. It, it warbles. And it does that all day long. <laughs> and one mnemonic that works for some people is if I see you, I will seize you, and I'll squeeze you till you squeak. <laughs> um, they're very cute little birds. This picture was amazing. Um, this woman who was on one of my walks saw this bird, hung around after the walk, and then, whoops, shoot, I thought I put the picture in. Got a picture of it actually on the nest, so I'll have to go back and put it in this. I have many different um, programs. I forget which pictures are in which. And the next three videos all have the same general pattern to their songs. Little phrases, a three or sometimes two notes, and... Um, this overall song rises or falls, and these guys should be called the Red Bull Vireo, as far as I'm concerned. They have huge energy. They start out singing fairly slowly on the morning. Just three notes up, three notes down. But after they warm up, I don't know how to spend time to eat. So do this all day, every day, from dawn until dark. <laughs> They're ridiculous. And they're always at the high, very highest parts of trees, so I don't get a good look at them. One man um, who lives 180 miles north of Toronto apparently had time on his hand. He spent a day with a clicker, counting the number of songs sung by a single red-eyed vireo. The bird sang 22,197 times one <laughs> I always hear their song as, some people say it's an elevator bird, going up, going down, but I really can hear that. I hear it as, I'm up here in the tree. You can't see. Hee, hee, hee. Because we can't see it. <clears throat> the red-eyed vireos can sound manic or hyper. The blue-headed vireos sing a similar song, but um, really more relaxed, or much more relaxed. And this bird was called... Um, Solitary vireo, if you have an older book, it's going to be called solitary vireo. It's the only vireo in our area that can be found in coniferous forests, so you can also find it in deciduous woods. This is the most colorful um, vireo in North America, breeds in open deciduous forests. Not all that common in this, in this state. And then these birds, beautiful birds, the males have been described as blue canaries, or like a scrap of sky with wings, which I think is such a lovely description. The females are mostly brown, sometimes with a touch of blue in the wings. They're sparrow-sized, they're widespread, um, they can be found in weedy fields and shrubby areas. Um, like most other blue birds, by the way, they actually don't have blue pigment. That jewel-like color comes from microscopic structures in the feathers that reflect and refract uh, light, blue light. And then the last of the little birds I'm going to talk about, this is a bird that makes us all happy. And when you came and you said they back yet, <laughs> we all are happy to see these sort of hummingbirds come every year. It's the only species of hummingbirds that nest east of the Mississippi. Um, they beat their wings about 53 times a second. They need a lot of fuel to, to, um, food to fuel that kind of activity. So they forage all day for nectar and small insects. They do stop moving sometimes, though they actually spend probably as many minutes sitting on a tree branch and pruning as other birds do. We just don't see them because they're so small. <clears throat> so this is what we very often see in the fall when the, the beautiful males have left and we're left with nothing but the immatures. They're, they're sort of wild looking. This section is through a window in the rain, so it's not a great picture. Um, but they are 
they sort of signal for me that the, not the end of spring migration, but close to the end of spring migration, and they come back. And I've left out a very important batch of birds so far um, that migrate, that have to do with spring migration, and I'll go quickly through them, and that is waterfowl, which is, after all, what National Wildlife Refuges are all about. There's a lot of migratory birds I mentioned already. If you notice, I didn't mention uh, thrushes, I mean, tanagers or thrashers or warblers because there's just too many to talk about. And many of those birds are being celebrated this weekend all over the United States. But we haven't, this is a, a major group of migrating birds, the one for which every one of the 560 national wildlife refuges in the country was established. <clears throat> so national wildlife refuges now have 150 million acres of, of land and water that provides um, habitat for 700 species of birds, 220 mammals, 250 reptiles and amphibians, 1,000 kinds of fish, 380 threatened or endangered plants, and then it's also got an additional 418 million acres of national marine monuments. This is an amazing resource that belongs to all of us. And every state and union has at least one national wildlife refuge. We have two, Missisquoi in the northwest and um, the uh, Silvio Conti National Wildlife Refuge in the um, Northeast Kingdom. Although we have only part of it, that's a really weird refuge. It's in three different states. <laughs> um, millions of ducks and geese and herons, grebes, cranes, and shorebirds rely on National Wildlife Refuges for breeding and raising young, or for spending the winter, or for feeding during migration. And they're paid for, the National Wildlife Refuges, almost exclusively by duck stamps which you can buy here and also at several um, post offices. 98 cents out of every dollar from the sale of duck stamps goes directly to buy or lease wetlands, yes. It has been said to be the most successful conservation program in the history of the world. It started way back in 1934. Um, very impressive. <clears throat> I mentioned before that we have two refuges and they're fabulous. The Silvio Conti is, by the way, the only refuge that, I just should have put that in there, that has the word fish in its name. It's actually called Silvio Conti National Wildlife and Fish Refuge. And that's because it was designed to include the entire Connecticut River watershed. And that, in order to do that, you're going to have to think of migratory fish also. This is place a lot smaller than the Silvio Conti. It's got 6,729 acres. <coughs> it's been recognized, though, as a Ramsar Conference wetland of international importance, which is a very high honor. The streams and rivers, marshes and ponds attract waterfowl most of the year, and several species nest here with peak use in the fall. That's the railroad trail up there on the uh, top right, and the um, discovery trail on the bottom right. In addition to ducks, there are two kinds of geese that show up at Missisquoi during fall migration, Canada geese and snow geese. This picture is not here, this picture is at Dead Creek in Addison. Canada geese nest here on the refuge. And like other wildlife refuges, Missisquoi hosts migrating waterfowl during fall migration, nesting waterfowl in the spring and summer, and wintering waterfowl. Got beautiful, beautiful mallards, perhaps the best recognized duck and the one that kids learn first, um, partly because they read make way for ducklings. Um, mallards have provided the genetic basis for many domestic ducks. Um, so that they, you very often found weird hybrids. American black ducks look very much like mallards and also hybridize with mallards. Um, these have had a decline for many years, whereas the numbers of mallards haven't. These ducks are puddle ducks or dabbling ducks, they're the ones that tip like this to eat aquatic vegetation. But we also have a few year round um, diving ducks. Excellent swimmers propel themselves underwater with their big feet. Uh, common mergansers are these large streamlined ducks. They, like other mergansers, have serrated bills so they can grab slippery fish. They eat almost nothing but fish. And they taste fishy. Hooded mergansers, I would say, are seriously cute ducks. <laughs> um, the male's breeding plumage is just gorgeous, black and white and chestnut. Um, both kinds of mergansers nest in tree cavities, sometimes in boxes put up with humans. And hooded mergansers often lay their eggs in other females' nests. And sometimes in the nests of, of ducks that aren't diving ducks, they'll lay their eggs in wood duck boxes. And sometimes wood ducks will lay their eggs in hooded merganser nests, meaning you can get a, a flock following a female that are both diving ducks and 
um, puddle ducks, and the babies seem to know which they're meant to be, even though their own parent isn't around, which is amazing. Um, the practice of laying eggs in another female's nest can lead to huge broods. Somebody found a female hooded merganser with 44 eggs in her nest. <laughs> and they weren't all hooded merganser eggs. And now these waterfowl are part of the great spring migration. And I'll go through these really quickly. These are all really handsome ducks. The wood duck, a floating rainbow. I mean, just a glorious looking little male. And we saw some just today down on Route 70, not on Route 78, but next to Route 78. The beaming tight teal is our smallest duck. Um, they're very skittish, really get, rarely get close enough to see the beautiful, beautiful colors of the male. <clears throat> the northern pintail has been described as the greyhound of ducks, an extremely elegant, streamlined kind of duck. Their numbers are going down drastically. Um, but they're still in good shape in, in places like Alaska and British Columbia, where they're basically in every puddle. <clears throat> and there's one, they come back quite early in the year, and here you can see they came back as next to a mallard, and it was already it was still um, snowy. The widgeon used to be called the bald paint, so if you're an older guy, it's, it's called bald paint. Um, nice descriptive name. The gadwall is unusual partly because it's a one-named bird. We don't have a whole lot of one-named birds. Um, and if we see these birds, we usually see them in pairs. These species select their mates for the next breeding season in fall, and they're together all year long. These birds are, if you ever see one of these up close, you'll know what you've got. The, the duck, the bill is six and a half inches long and spoon-shaped. <laughs> the shoveler is a good name. Spectacular looking um, male birds, they're just glorious. And I've only seen them in the refuge in early spring when there are flooded fields across the road. Sometimes in the flood, you've seen them in the flooded fields. These are often the first ducks to leave, excuse me, south in the fall and the first ducks to head north in the spring. They arrive in, arrive in Vermont in late April or May. These are really long distance migrants. Um, one bird banded in Alberta was shot in Venezuela only a month later. It's a long bunch of flying. And then we have ring neck ducks that breed here. Um, most of this species breed in Canada, but some breed here. And they're sort of funny looking. They've got, um, they really are, they've got pointed heads. <laughs> Bright red eyes. The ring neck is a ridiculous name. You can only see the ring neck if you have the bird in your hand and you blow the neck feathers out of the way. Many of the birds were named by people who collected birds by shooting them. So they named them for characteristics they could see in, in hand, not characteristics we could see in the field. Um, so tomorrow there will be lots of opportunities to see migratory ducks and all the other birds that are returning to Vermont to nest or just passing <coughs> through on their uh, way to breeding places further north. So I hope all of you are going to take in some of the walks tomorrow, which I think will be spectacular. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>